Welcome to the Head Shepherd Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Ferguson, CEO here at NextGen Agri International, where we help livestock managers get the best out of their stock. Before we get started, thank you to our two fantastic sponsors for continuing to sponsor this podcast. MSD Animal Health is perhaps better known as Cooper's Animal Health in Australia and for their all-flex range across the world with a comprehensive suite of animal health and management products. Honig is a one-stop shop for wool harvesting and animal fibre removal. The Honiger team have a deep understanding of livestock agriculture, backed by Swiss engineering and a family business dedicated to manufacturing the best. We are grateful to our sponsors for their support, helping us bring Head Shepherd to you each week. And now it's time to get on with this week's episode. Welcome back to Head Shepherd, coming to you from Cambridge in Canada, actually. It's just out Guelph, not too far from Toronto. Been doing a bit of a tour of the sheep industry here. So you'll get that podcast in a few weeks. We'll, we'll record all of what we've seen over here. So that should be it's been a great, it's been a really great trip. And uh, yeah, so look forward to telling you about all that. But before we get into that, uh, we've got we've got Beck Molseed on today's show, which is a great story. But we'll get uh, we'll hear from Sophie about an article she's written that's that should be on the hub uh, before we get into that. Yeah, so it was my turn to write an article this week. I'm sure you've all noticed that me and Ferg are taking it in turns. Um, and I decided to write one on cultivating commitment, basically retaining good staff. It's an ongoing issue in farming, finding good staff, retaining them when they're there, and just a few tips and tricks. As someone that has both managed staff and worked under a manager about what is good working environment, good home environment, um, and just, yeah, what we should be doing as an industry to to keep those people not only in the job but in the industry too. Um, you know, it's, it's a modern world out there. People have got social media. People see what other people's lives are living. And, yeah, it's just a different – I think it's a different world hiring these days. And, and yeah, I just thought I'd put it all down in an article of, I don't know, what, how I think you can best cultivate that commitment and that loyalty within a farm business and get the best results out of your staff as well as your production. Fantastic. Yeah, obviously any business is about the people and ours being no different and yeah, definitely farming businesses, you definitely see sort of succeed or, or have a tough road if you, if, yeah, if with a lot of staff turnover, it's hard to, hard to run good business. Yeah, this week on the show, we've got Beck Molseed. So she uh, works there for RIST and, and is the National Coordinator for Lifetime Year Management, which is why some people might know, know that name. But the reason we got her on the show is what she does outside of work hours, actually, which is umpiring women's Australian rules football, which uh, is a growing sport for women in, in Australia. Uh, obviously, that sport's only played in, in Australia, but it's a massive thing in the southern half of Australia. And, and yeah, we, we had a chat with Beck about uh, umpiring not just the women's game of the uh, women's version of the game, but also men's football. So yeah, the, I guess out there with with a heap of a heap of testosterone charged blokes playing sport, and and yeah, and I guess some of the the lessons that she learnt from uh, has learnt from doing that, and yeah, and it's just a great great chat. Well, obviously we're not a sports podcast, but it is yeah, it's great to to celebrate what Beck has done and is doing because we know that sport is the lifeblood of a lot of rural communities, and a lot of you listening are, are out there in those communities and. And use that Saturday or, or Friday night sport or whatever it is to catch up with with mates and and talk about other stuff, but also farming, no doubt. But yeah, it's a re- yeah, great to to hear Beck's story and and how she's really inspiring lots of young women and and doing a great job at the same time. Welcome, Beck Molsey, to Head Shepherd. Thanks, Berg, for having me on. Excellent. We're going to change gears a bit this week and not talk too much about farming. Obviously. People may know you through your role at RIST as the National Coordinator for Lifetime Year Management and I'm sure other things there at RIST. Yes. But, but uh, yeah, I guess today we want to talk about when you made headlines uh, last year, I think, to, as the first female uh, umpire for Aussie Rules football in your part of the world. Obviously, yes. lots of lots of blokes in that game and when I grew up, it was definitely definitely the women played netball and the and the men played football, and that sort of obviously evolved to heat. Maybe we might just, before we get into that too much detail, we've got listeners kind of all over the place, and so we might just explain what Aussie rules football is to start with. Yeah, it's a bit different from NRL. Good old Aussie football played with a oval-shaped ball, not a round ball, on an oval, and your aim is to kick it through the big two sticks at the either end of the field for a goal. But, yeah, it's totally it's a different sport, but thoroughly enjoyable and definitely growing in the female community with AWFL and then all the women's teams um, and leagues around all different districts, um, your seniors, your juniors, your youth, it's just growing, which is fantastic to see. 
Yeah, they've got two well, two nieces in Melbourne that used to play it and certainly one that's still playing it and loving it. So, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing to see the sport evolve. Oh, yeah, so it is, I don't know, yeah, I guess the differences between it and what people might know in Europe is maybe football, normal football, which is, well, the first football, I guess, was yeah, yeah. round ball on a square <laughs> square pitch or a rectangle pitch, whereas this is obviously on an oval. Yeah, you've got four sticks to kick at, two will get yeah. in the middle, two will get you six points and... If you go either side of that, you'll get one. And if you miss completely, you get zero, obviously. But, um, Absolutely. Massive cardio, sport. Like one of the toughest games I only played as a kid. But uh, certainly in terms of how much running you do, how fit you need to be to play that game as well as um, – yeah, and it's quite physical as well, obviously. So it's probably not many sports where you have to travel as far as well as be hit as hard as what as what you do in Aussie rules. Oh, absolutely. I've got some – former bruises from playing it myself. Yeah, um, yeah you definitely got to be in good shape uh, well to tackle, handle those tackles. Yeah, 100%. So anyway, so if we move on, obviously at some point along your career you've played football, but you were just saying as we started recording that you're trying to retire from that the body's starting to get sick of being beaten up. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I was very fortunate. I captained a, the Hamilton Kangaroos to their premiership side for the senior women's um, and I've also played for Horsham who this year actually won the premiership as well so amiably I'd like to retire on a high so that yeah no more injuries but that's why I've actually moved over to umpiring and being a field umpire because as much as I absolutely love to play the game I just it's just hurting too much so now I'm still on the field running around but also now running around with all the men on the field that you're still part of the game. You don't um, you don't get tackled. If an umpire gets tackled, there's definitely something wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you still feel like you're a part of it. You're not missing out. You're keeping your fitness up. And it's such a great skill to be able to do, undertake is umpiring and being a field umpire. So I was very fortunate. Um, I was the first field, uh, female field umpire in the Minanera League, which is out here um, near Hamilton, north of Hamilton or off to the side a bit. And that's been a huge life changing um skill set that you learn and um, I naturally want to keep growing my own skill set and in, actually inspire more women to come on out or girls to come on out and start up their umpiring yeah cool probably I don't know I think in most regional sport one of the hardest things to get is, is good umpires or consistently get umpires like everyone obviously there isn't uh yeah sometimes it can be pretty tough, which we'll get into. The I mean, you've, we've heard the, the normal white maggot chat and all the all the <laughs> stuff that people used to get. Yeah, well, I guess you don't wear white these days. Maybe maybe that helps that. But but yeah, obviously you're in the heat of the battle really when you're on a, an umpire of any any sport. And people, a lot of people, oh. once they cross that white line, they turn into different humans. And so oh, you, would have you get that. white line fever definitely kicks in absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you've got like 36 men on a field or with white line fever, so passionate about their football. And you're there to adjudicate it to the best of your ability to be fair and reasonable. And that's one of the best skills that you can learn being an umpire is how to take out your bias and go, right, I've got to call it, see it, protect the head, protect the players and try and have that communication skills. That's probably one thing I've really taken away from being an umpire is your ability to communicate and your voice is such a powerful tool to use um, and how to de-escalate situations, how to listen, how to calm down you don't want to be reaching for your yellow or red cards and pull them out of your sock to send someone off you want to try and keep it enjoyable and fair for the whole for both teams yeah excellent i mean we're we're far from a sports podcast but that's not going to stop us this today but <laughs> the um i reckon some of the best refs umpires you see are the ones that are communicating all the time like you can just hear them continually talking to the to the players and and letting them know that that's not on or is on or whatever like it's like which yeah everyone responds to i think when when they kind of know they're not going to get away with too much, but also they've given them enough leniency to, to keep the game moving. Oh, absolutely. And that's probably one thing you can learn, like being an umpire, is you can also then take that skill set outside into your work, into life, and understanding that I'm on one side of the play trying to understand what I'm seeing, and you'll hear the crowd on the other side of the play going, oh, what happened there, ref? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, okay, there's two sides here. I've got to get around the contest, see what's actually happening to try and make that correct call. But also you can look, Associate that back in life going, if you've got a situation where somebody's thinks something you can't, you've got to move your perception and your thoughts around to be able to try and understand what they're seeing, what you're seeing, and make a, an informed decision. And that's been like a big sort of a great learning curve that I've taken away. Yeah, for sure. I've heard 
one of the better things I heard the other day on the sideline was take off your eye patch and, and see both sides. There'll be a fair, <laughs> fair few one-eyed supporters out there and one-eyed players, no doubt. And everyone thinks, I mean, yeah, after my boys walk off the game, they, they think the ref's been unfair, which clearly they weren't. <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess being a woman out yeah, with 36 emotionally charged blokes, <laughs> is there, I mean, does that get, I'm kind of thinking that would de-escalate things rather than escalate things when compared to a male of similar age and similar whatever that they would normally encounter? Yeah, it was definitely a sort of a different different attitude that you have. Like the guys were, I think, like really respectful and I think in ways it's, they've sort of had to go, oh, she's female, okay, better behave. I had one instance when I was like my first or second game, I wasn't getting my ball-ups weren't high enough in the air and I had a one of the players or the captain come up to me and goes, oh, we don't want to criticise, but can you get your ball up just a bit higher? And I'm like, yeah, no worries, mate. Okay, I'll do that. So called my next ball up and really, you know, lift it up, heaved it up and, yep, ran past the captain onto my next contest. I said, how was that? He said, yeah, all great, keep going, keep going. And I'm like, fantastic. And it's that communication and that side of it that they realise that you're actually not there to be evil. You're wanting to enjoy it as much as they do. So talk to us. We're happy to explain the rules or um, if you want something adjusted, like if like the ball ups, happy to do that. That's probably why I enjoy it. You, you feel like you're a part of the game. Yeah, yeah. No, you've already mentioned personal growth, but I guess is there much, have you gone through like, have a training to do that sort of stuff or has it just been, you know, the game and here's the whistle and hook into it or? I suppose I was a bit fortunate playing the game that you already had a basic understanding of the rules, but then I um, naturally inquired through the AFL website and they put me in to, um, in contact with the club local to Hamilton, the umpires, and I got the president. He took me out to the first game, ran with me right beside me and then just attended trainings um, and information sessions and just kept growing my knowledge and skills. But the best learning I've learned has been out in the field having coaches come out afterwards and say, right, you did well, you've got to stop doing this or adjust this or come around this way and run a bit your different diagonals to keep learning. And, yeah, hands-on learning is far, by far most the, the best um, way to do it. Yeah, I guess hands-on learning, but, yeah, often you want to do hands-on learning without being watched, but obviously <laughs> the, obviously, there's a few people around the sidelines watching and when those early games must have been a little bit nerve-wracking despite any preparation. Oh, 100%. 100%. You're walking out there and you're like, this is a very male-dominated sport. Here I am, the only female in the middle here. Wow. I suppose I put extra pressure on myself to try and do a really good job to justify while I'm out there. But the compliments have been coming through. The support's been coming through immensely. And I'd love to see more females out there coming on board, especially in the farming and the rural communities there is opportunities there to support your local clubs and um, whether it's boundary, field, goal, umpiring, it's it's great to just get out there and help your local club. Uh, how many, what do you do in terms of your tractor case? How many, what do you run in a, in a normal game? <laughs> oh, um, different games, different scenarios, um, but yeah, anywhere between 12 to 14 Ks on a good senior men's game yeah, um, in a two yeah. umpires situation, you, you're running back and forth that field. Yep, yeah, it definitely Especially yeah. in the seniors, we're fully timed games. We are definitely locking them up. Yeah, yeah. No, it's um, fair few, fair bit of ground to cover up and down because obviously they can kick sixty meters. You've got to, well, obviously two umpires, but you don't have to. Yeah, but you can. They move that ball moves around pretty quick. Oh yeah, and you and you just run smarter, not harder. You just run out on the angle and then get in a better position to look in on the side. But naturally, uh, fatigue kicks in, and you are trying to still make you know a judgment call while on the run and then keep pushing again down to the next position so and that's in life you get fatigued you've got to learn how to still make decisions and that's part and parcel of it yeah and the beauty about that fatigue is as you get tired of the the stakes get higher really as you get closer to the <laughs> final whistle everything yeah, the emotion starts getting higher and, yeah. oh yeah especially finals games or um games where they're you know the top two sides or middle sides of the, it's very even game yeah. Stakes get higher, intensity gets higher, and you can get a little bit of that um, backlash a little bit as well. But like anything, you learn to build resilience from it, and that's one thing I've enjoyed learning is that when the players are out there, they are if they do get a bit, you know, lippy or something like that. Most of the time, they're actually frustrated themselves. They've missed the mark, they haven't handballed it, the kick went off to the shank to oh, the yeah. left. Yeah, yeah, it's not at you at all. You just water off the duck's back, keep moving. 
and just um, control the game. So yep. and that's been another great skill to learn. Yeah, cool. I'm thinking you played footy with probably hundreds of women, for with and against hundreds of women, and only not many of you decided to go umpiring. Are you normally someone that sort of likes to jump out of your comfort zone, or is this a bit of a bit of a step up for you, or is it something you normally normally try and challenge yourself? Oh, I definitely like to challenge myself. This is definitely a um, outside my comfort zone, but I suppose it's something I enjoy, keep fit, and probably trying to inspire more people to do something that they haven't thought of. So, you know, that's probably why I try and get around different clubs, umpiring with women's, men's, the junior kids, so that parents can see, well, if, if she's doing it, others can jump on board and have a go as well. So there is a, there's a heap of opportunities out there, but definitely my personality type is have a go at something that, may not be happening very often. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And you mentioned sort of stuff that I guess, yeah, what you learn on the field and where you, where you take that in terms of, yeah, I mean, resilience. Are you, have you, I mean, it's pretty hard to self-assess, I suppose, but have you noticed any changes from, from sort of life pre-umpiring to now? Definitely. Like in your day-to-day life, you'll find people that get frustrated at you, like um, work life uh, outside of working in just general conversations people might get frustrated with a decision or a direction you're going with and that just comes back to communication resilience and uh, and understanding that they could be having a bad day or something hasn't gone right they've interpreted something differently to the way you've explained it and that I think in itself has helped a lot in building that skill set to take a step back and not be emotional about the situation because I can honestly say there's been times I've come off that field and I have been exhausted and you know felt the pressure of umpiring such a challenging game and you do have to try and step up and rise above it and keep pushing through it and after when you finish it you're like wow I did that I can't believe I got through that and same in life you can apply that exact same skill set again out here. Yeah, and yeah, one thing I struggle with, or have struggled with, or maybe still do, I don't know. But the is like, I guess when you know, like having a science brain like mine, you kind of have this perception that, well, you have, you have the theory that there's there is one source of truth, whereas there actually isn't, because truth is just what people perceive <laughs> it as. And and while I guess Newton's theory is truth, but then for, there's lots of other bits of, particularly in livestock and farming, I suppose, is not everything works everywhere, and there's different different theories and stuff that we have to encounter and it is quite frustrating when when you think you know the truth but someone else is seeing looking at exactly the same situation as coming up with a different truth and that's kind of that's umpiring but that's life as well that like you only see what you see and you get to make your call but someone else has a different perspective different confirmation bias different whatever will have a different interpretation based on yeah what they want to believe half the time or whatever so it's yeah it is i'm sure there's great life skills in in having to live in that world where yeah, you have to stick and you have to back your judgment and you see one thing i hate i suppose i hate a strong word but when you're on the on the sideline and you've got kids trying umpiring like early on and you've got some stupid parent yelling at them and you know that it's like they're trying to do the it's a pretty tough gig out there in the first place and then yeah and it's um pretty horrible when you see you around the around the trap so it's it it's not good just to, in football it's in all sports as well and that's where we just ask for people to be a little bit more like they have that respect towards us we're still learning our interpretation is going to be different to what they see and that's that whole their view on a situation whereas in the other umpire can be can be completely blindsided by another player that's just gone straight in front of their vision and could yeah. not see exactly what you just saw. Yeah. It's having that ability to shift perspectives and um, and be encouraging and realising that. But naturally, like anything, you want to protect the players, um, especially with the heads, with the concussions and being mindful of um, ensuring that they are not getting um, any intentional or dirty play, as I call it. It's got to be fair and reasonable and just being on the ball to watch it all. Yeah, yeah. What's the ultimate aim on every young AFL footballer sort of dreams of running onto the MCG at grand final day? Or is what's the what's the top end of where you'd like to see this part of your career go? I would like to try and get up into the highest level of football umpiring um, in our region, which is probably the Hampton League. So I really want to build my skills and my fitness and um, run in that league uh, eventually and try and inspire more to do the same and I'd love to take some younger females under my wing in some junior games and get them umpiring in the field position so that they enjoy it and know that there's a female there to support them through that journey as well but definitely in the Hampton and look for that long-term opportunity in finals don't think BFL or AFLW is quite on the cards for me (laughs) Um, but how nice would it be if 
someone in our region took it up and they went on to their dream and yeah. I could have helped them inspired to go that way. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. No, we can't all, can't all plan now. I'm sure that's what I wanted to do when I was five, but <laughs> didn't get anywhere. <laughs> not even on this, not even the same state, really. But anyway, it's all good. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, awesome to see that people out there challenging themselves and yeah, inspiring young people to do do great things to keep our regions firing and and lively and and happy. It's um obviously you're you're there in Southwest Victoria, probably one of the toughest periods. Uh, the, the region's seen in terms of weather and stuff. So it's a it's an important year to have resilience building going on. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's, you know, football plays such a huge part in our communities in bringing people together where other people are all challenged from different angles and having that communication, networking ability and footy brings that over that period and then we go into cricket as well over the summer. But, yeah, Naturally, we're always looking for more officials in all forms of sport. So there is some really great benefits to learn from being official in your sport that you love and contributing to your own community and helping grow that and foster future generations as well. Perfectly, perfectly said. And, yeah, obviously the lifeblood of rural communities is, is country mm-hmm. sport and, yeah, I don't know, the untold, well, yeah, who knows how many how many mental health situations have been saved by rocking up on a Saturday morning and, and supporting your team or whatever, and um, whether it's netball or footy or, or cricket in the summer. and um, Yeah, obviously a massive part of community and, and getting people off farm, which is critical to most. It's You're kind of oh. completely enclosed in, in life and getting off farm for that bit of a relief and seeing, seeing a few mates, maybe yelling at an umpire or two, but the... <laughs> <laughs> Yep, I always say actually when I realise if I think I've done a good job is when the losing team will come up to you and actually shake your hand and say thank you, well done for umpiring because that there tells you that you've actually done a fair job because even though they've lost, it's not you that they're blaming it on or taking it on. They're actually looking at their own sort of self-awareness or skill set there. That's when I probably have the most value out of the game. And, yeah, getting off the field. I haven't ha- ever been in a situation where someone's come up and said anything mean. If anything, I've actually had a lot of community support being out there and people just, yeah, saying thank you and well done and um, great job and great to see a female out there. So uh, cool. I'd yeah. love to see more. Yeah. I guess most people, once the once the white, once we're back over the other side of the white line, everyone <laughs> sort of calms down again and, and turn back into humans again, which is always, <laughs> always good. <laughs> yeah. We were talking just before coming online and you said you'd got an award as well, Beck. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Yes, I have just actually received the AFL Victoria's um, Umpiring Service Award. So I was nominated by some local clubs around this region for the inspiration they've seen in me being a female umpire out here um, and trying to inspire and grow more um, opportunities for women and girls to join into umpiring. Like I've got an idea and I put it to Hampton um, that I'm aware of that we try and get like an all-female team umpiring a game and I actually worked out that we had uh, nearly all women and girls in the under-18 Youth Girls Grand Final. Um, So myself was included and we only had one male umpire, the rest were all females and I was absolutely ecstatic to see that actually progress um, to that level. So that's one of my – I've been – very lucky to receive that award and very honoured as well. Awesome. Ah, congratulations. One of the questions we always ask guests, which I didn't give you any warning on this, so you can take <laughs> as long as you need, but the uh, is what is the last thing you changed your mind about? Last thing I changed my mind about? Yeah, yeah. As in out there in the umpire world or just in general? Anything. Oh, yeah, you didn't give me free warning on that <laughs> one. <laughs> no. Um, last thing I changed my mind. It's a tough question. Uh, it is I, a tough one. <laughs> yeah. It's actually, yeah. I was actually umpiring on Sunday and this is where I had to adjust myself because I went from like a senior men's games that I've been doing over the winter and now the um, women's side is kicked up over in the Limestone Coast and I did a game on Sunday and naturally each league has slightly variations in how you umpire. So most of well, when I'm doing the men's, I say stand on the mark, which is what they must stand, otherwise if they step forward, you can take a 50-metre penalty. Whereas in, in the women's, in the limestone, they're actually like move on the mark um, sideways. They just can't step over it. So naturally I had to adjust and change my mind on a decision there and gone, oh, I'm sorry, I was 
that's my bad. Uh, You're allowed to move, just don't step over the line or step over the mark there and um, not penalise them. So that's something, yeah, you had to quickly adjust to. Yeah, (laughs) I'm not sure what else changed my mind. No, yeah. I'm I'm very decisive, I think, actually, so it's... (laughs) Yeah, it's a tough question and that's why we ask it, to make people think a bit differently, get... We, uh, yeah, sometimes it extracts different answers out of different people. So it's particularly if we've been talking something science the whole time, it's sort of <laughs> um, nice to get cut to someone's personality a bit with that question. So that's why it's asked. But um, yeah, I reckon yeah, it's going to be interesting to to see whether yeah how how women's footy continues to evolve. I mean, it's certainly, I don't know how old is how long since it was sort of how long's oh, ten years more, fifteen years. I don't know since it really sort of started to take off. Um, good question. I actually haven't looked up the stats of when AFLW kicked off. I think it may have been coincided with the same time that NRL Women's was at, um, also going ahead as well. Yeah. Um, I think they're about the same same era, um, but it's definitely grown. We've now seen um, all AFL teams have all got an AFLW women's team in the league, and that's grown over time. I like, definitely grown very rapidly, and. Like in this region, the under-15s, there's more teams coming into our Western Victorian Female Football League, which is brilliant um, to see young ones also taking up the football and hopefully they will be the next generation coming through. So it's definitely growing and hopefully will keep growing as well. So now it's the umpire's side to go with that side and bring more women into umpiring. Yeah, and I think just for those listeners who have never lived in Southern Australia, the like it's the fury or the passion around AFL, which is Australian Rules Football League, is or Australian Football League, but yeah, Australian Rules Football is insane. Like you'll get it's kind of what I guess baseball is to a US country town and what, mm-hmm. what ice hockey uh-huh. is to a Canadian town. Like it's it's absolute the life like it's massive. Um I think people when I mean, obviously it's only played in Southern Australia and, and so a lot of people around the world wouldn't no, mm-hmm. but it's there's as much passion and as much yeah, um, yeah, focus as, as any sport you'll ever see anywhere. Hundred yeah. percent. With sort of fifty, sixty thousand people turning up to a weekend game, just yeah, just to back their back their clubs. Yeah. Absolutely, and we what we just had Katie Perry at our AFL Grand Final. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. definitely our nation's largest sport. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Victorians will watch any sport. Yeah. But- but the- <laughs> I'm a bit biased, I should say, because um, the NRL will definitely probably disagree yeah. with me yeah. on that. Um, yeah. But for us out down here, we love our footy. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. Awesome, Beck. Well, we'll leave you get back to do some work, but yeah, thanks very much for for coming on. Thanks for yeah for yeah for inspiring some young women out there, hopefully, and and uh, and yeah, it's awesome to see people getting out of their comfort zone, doing doing things that aren't what, aren't what everyone else is doing, and and uh, yeah, and and uh, keeping rural sport ticking over at the same time. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Berg. Much, much appreciated. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks again to Heinegger, who are proud world leaders in the manufacturing and supply of professional sheep shearing and clipping equipment. Thank you to MNSD Animal Health and Orflex Livestock Intelligence. They offer an extensive livestock product portfolio focused on animal health management, all backed up by exceptional service. We thank both of these companies for their ongoing support of the Head Shepherd podcast. 